Good city. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we have another session on a uh, virtual tumor board. Uh, session tonight, sorry, sorry about the, uh, the passcode. That's the new Zoom rule that all meetings has, should have passcode. So we'll make sure that the next time that doesn't happen. Uh, we're very fortunate tonight to have a uh, all-star pa uh, panel and Jeff uh, Liu from uh, Temple University is going to be the host tonight. So I'm not going to say talk too much and uh, Jeff should take it away. Great. Can you all hear me? I'm having yep. one second. Yes. And uh, I think Pete Bossler was going to go first. Uh, Pete is a facu is faculty at Johns Hopkins. I'm going to welcome everyone to the call while Pete is getting his slides up. Um, today's topic is early larynx cancer. Um, we have Dr. Susan McCammon, who's also here from the University of Alabama, and also Steve Chin, who I think made it to the call. He's right there. Right there, awesome. In, in his Michigan today. guard. Yeah. And he's <laughs> exactly University of Michigan. So, um, Pete, whenever you're ready, uh, you can go ahead and take it away. All right. So I'll just get started right off the bat. Here we go. So I have my first. My patient is a um, 58-year-old. He was originally initially referred for uh, dysphonia and adenophonia and some mild dysphagia. It started about one and a half to two years ago. He's got a significant past medical history. He has lung cancer, uh, adenocarcinoma, um, left upper lobe, uh, lobe, and stage three melanoma. And his surgical history is uh, commensurate with the uh, past medical history. Uh, he had a robotic left uh, lung lobectomy and lymphadenectomy in 2019. And he also had a, that's for the lung cancer and wide local excision central lymph node biopsy with completion nodal dissection in 2012, treated with interferon. His social history is significant for smoking one pack per day for 30 years. And moving right on to the um, physical exam, everything is unremarkable except for the uh, flexible fiber optic uh, laryngoscopy uh, exam, where you can see this um, uh, leukoplakia um, throughout the, the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis, extending into the petiole onto the area epiglottic folds, false folds, and down to the true vocal uh, cord on the, the right hand side, and there's some on the left hand side too. So this looks pretty bad. Um, and we this was seen by my one of my laryngology colleagues up front, and he decided to appropriately to take the patient to the operating room. And we got a nice view of the uh, larynx. And he did a um, biopsy where he excised this lesion here on the right uh, vocal cord, um, sampled the left vocal cord, and did samplings of the, um, the epiglottis as well. And then this is a pathology report. If we could pause, if you go back one slide for me, Pete. So if we could pause for a second. So Susan, when you see these patients in the office, you know, they clearly have an identifiable lesion of the vocal cord, but they sort of have, clearly have this area of leukoplakia. Can you just talk about how you sort of parcel out or parse out the different pieces of the examination and plan for your uh, operation for biopsy? Sure. So um, can you hear me? Am I muted? Just like to double check. You're good. <laughs> Yeah, so when I see a larynx that looks like this in clinic, um, I really want to get it cleaned up as much as possible before I make an intervention. So I'll typically do a strobe so I can see what I need to see. And I'll typically treat them empirically short term for thrush and for reflux just to optimize them and bring them back for another strobe um, in a couple of weeks. And then Based on what it looks like then, I'll move forward with um, an operative biopsy, but I try to get it as medically optimized as I can before I go in, because this to me looks like, you know, diffuse badness all over the larynx, some of which may be cancer and some of which may not. So on your first um, evaluation, just, I know it's the images are, are what they are. Um, was your first thinking that just based on the images you think this, I mean, obviously we all entertain the possibility of cancer, but sometimes we see an image and we're like, that's definitely cancer. We just need to prove it. And other times we're like, eh, going back and forth. Um, what is your impression of the images here that, um, you know, would you say it's definitely cancer or that, um, like you said, you're trying to clean up the, the other issues first before moving forward? Yeah, I don't think everything that I'm looking at here is cancer. I would say the, um, 
the more distal glottic area is more concerning to me. I mean, it looks like this is some Reinke's edema plus some leukoplakia plus some, you know, gradu that could be thrush or, you know, thermal trauma from inhalational injury. Crack smoking is what we see in Alabama. So, um, I mean, this is definitely someone that I wouldn't be, I wouldn't reassure. I would say I, I'm concerned you have cancer, but <clears throat> I would like to be more directed when I do do my biopsy. Steve, comments, thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I am, I guess, not as sophisticated. I, I, I think it's a great idea to medically optimize. Um, you know, I tend to, you know, I would look at this and I agree that this whole thing doesn't look like cancer. There's some areas of concern, but, you know, the area down the glottis probably is the most concerning. Thanks, um, Max. But, you know, I, I, and then I would try and go in and take some targeted biopsies kind of based on once I have them asleep, you know, um, under DL to get a better look at things. Okay. Sounds but I like good. The I idea would add of that optimizing. Yeah, the purpose of direct laryngoscopy is not really diagnosis; it's actually mapping the tumor, and that's what the way I look at it. And I always tell my residents, you know, especially when you're at VA, that are all super high risk. First of all, you can never get a very good view in the office with flexible. And second of all, it's a VR surgical oncologist, and it's just diagnosing cancer is not adequate. You've got to have it staging. And for larynx, obviously, a very sensitive, small organ, it's uh, really important to have that. Yeah. I, I would add that um, while you, an operative examination under anesthesia gives you different options, I find that the fiber optic laryngoscopy and the awake patient in the office sometimes gives me a different view than the operative laryngoscopy and the anesthetized patient. So I, I use both of those to... Yeah complement each other, especially for like dynamic um, changes in the way the, you know, the cords move and the way the, the mucus changes. So. Um. I agree. That's a great point. I couldn't agree more. I completely agree. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. I think, yeah. I think pointing out that the dynamic functional aspects as well as the visual aspects are both important pieces of information for sure. Uh, Pete, you want to continue? Looks like you did a biopsy. Yeah. No, I do want to say the strobe was done, but I don't typically do strobes. I don't have access to the, the stroboscopy in my, my clinic, but the laryngologists all you know, routinely do them. So they, they did a strobe, and this is a picture of his strobe. Um, this is the operative uh, picture of the glottis, and then the here's the biopsy. So not on, on uh, not what is not to be unexpected is so the right cord had high grade dysplasia, no no cancer. Left grade, left cord had low grade dysplasia, and the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis, which just looked like leukoplakia, had at least uh, um, carcinoma in situ or high grade grade dysplasia, uh, with a focus for uh, suspicious for invasion. And this is when I heard about the patient. Um, this patient was presented at our tumor board with this uh, pathology report. So the question is, what do you want to, to do at this point in the management of it? Would you, uh, you have a question of uh, invasive carcinoma. Well, let's ask so, the esteemed panel. It's, uh, I see Dr. Nicole Fowler here. Uh, Nicole, you're from University of Washington. Do I have it right? That's where I did my fellowship at Matt. University oh, Hospitals in Cleveland. Great, I'm sorry about that. So um, oh. what do you think about this case and what would you do now? So I think the trouble is how diffuse the area is, um, you know, where you're actually, where you took almost that polyp off on the right side is the high grade dysplasia, sure. But then that epiglottic area, at least on the, those flexible pictures that you showed us seems quite diffuse. Um, and sh so the question is, you know, the treatment that you want to offer, you want it to be commiserate with just how severe um, the problem is this isn't diffuse invasive carcinoma everywhere. It's certainly going to be mild, moderate, and then severe in certain places with probably a, several focus of um, invasion throughout that. Um, so this is where I think lasers play a big role um, for me, just because it allows kind of a, a surface area. The problem is the more you biopsy, the more you continue to get what you got on the third one, which says, you know, at least... Um, uh, in situ and suspicious for invasion, but um, 
that's kind of how I look at it. Um, yeah, the field of cancerization is definitely a challenge. Pete, did you mention the um, functional uh, findings? I'm sorry if you mentioned it already. I missed it on the slide. Yeah, so he had bilateral vocal cord mobility, good glottic closure. He had no um, evidence of aspiration. He was seen by a speech pathologist as well. So functionally, he was he was doing well. Okay, great. So Pete, can you bring the, the clinical function? image one more time? Just why we're discussing that. Go ahead, Jeff. I'll just. Oh, and then a question for the group. I'll we'll go to Steve first. Um, how many of you would obtain imaging at this point in time, given a carcinoma in situ diagnosis? Let's say you have an awesome stroboscopy, like you, Pete. My my laryngologists are very protective of their stroboscopy, so they don't let me use it uh, very often, if at all. Um, but you have all, you know, you have the functional information. You see, you have the office examination. Would any of you get imaging? And if so, what would you, what would you be looking for? Yeah, I, I would, I would, you know, with the at least or concerning, highly concerning for invasive, you know, at this point, I probably would get a CT neck um, at a minimum, you know, and that's mostly to look at like pre epiglottic invasion, just in case this thing's, you know, deeper and sneakier than it is, because, you know, the question is, what are we ultimately going to do? Is it going to be some sort of, you know, um, endoscopic you know, resection versus, you know, RT versus RT plus, you know, chemo if it's, if it's, you know, T3 based on that preepiglottic kind of invasion. So at a minimum, I'd probably get a CT neck and probably a chest just at the same time. Yeah. Would anybody, I, I agree with that. I, yeah. especially with the superglottic involvement, I would want to know what's happening in the neck and the preepiglottic space. And also if this patient has a smoker, I would go ahead and get the chest CT at the same time. Yeah, I, I agree. I think both points that were raised by Nicole and Steve uh, and Susan were excellent. The question in my mind is, is this one tumor that's spreading everywhere or is either multiple foci uh, separately? And if there is any bulk in of this tumor going endophytically, going toward the periglottic space, I would definitely get a CT. And I would uh, ask uh, Pete, um, this is what really the, the intraoperative exam is really important, getting good high quality images and kind of looking exactly where the tumor starts and where the tumor stops. And if you clinically don't see anything, but everything you biopsy is cancer, it's very different that you see a, a clear tumor that starts in the glottis, been neglected for, I like say you said two years, and it's kind of a slowly came up to the superglottis. To, in my mind, those are a little bit different, might not be eventually, but at least I wanna know what I'm dealing with. Okay, um, take it away, Pete. So you did your biopsies and ne with next steps? Well, the biopsies were done and it was presented to me and it came with imaging. So, right. So I think it's appropriate to get uh, CT neck uh, and chest was, was done, especially with the history of lung cancer in this, this gentleman. Um, they didn't see, and the CT neck didn't really show anything. They didn't really see a mass, didn't see any lymph lymphadenopathy. Um, a PET scan was also obtained. I would not have gotten a PET scan. I think it's a bit overkill for, for this. Um, I think a CT neck and chest is sufficient, but everything was, was uh, got for this guy. And of course, the PET scan was obtained within a couple of weeks of having the biopsies. So had some FDG avidity in the area of the, um, the larynx where the biopsy was, but no evidence of any uh, mass. So it doesn't, sh it shows that we don't have a, a large uh, mass in the, in the epiglottis in the larynx that would uh, upstage it from what it is, but we still don't have um, a, a clear diagnosis for this. Uh, so my plan was to well, take Before you go there, you, um, uh, what, what's your next slide? If I, uh, so I wanna see what um, people would do before I, you disclose your, uh, what you ended up doing. I think I, I think it might be pathology. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so Arno, what, what would you do? So the imaging is negative. The function is excellent. Um, there's just this, you know, paste all over the endolarynx, including the laryngeal surface epiglottis. That's at least carcinoma in situ. That's our most advanced. Like, you know, it's not. If, if I'm right, Pete, it's not truly invasive carcinoma. It's only carcinoma in situ that's been reported. Right. We don't have a diagnosis of invasive carcinoma. Swim cell carcinoma. Great. So Arno, what would you do next? Well, I really like Susan's idea of really trying to medically optimize this patient. There's obviously some inflammatory component probably driving some of this. So I'd like to see that larynx, larynx much cleaner before I take it to the operating room. Um, and then I would, I think as was suggested, I would want to approach this with a transoral laser 
approach. I kind of start in a kind of sequential, maybe start at the area that I'm worried about most where the CIS potentially invasive disease was described. And depending on what I find, you know, I might address maybe the epiglottis and then maybe one side of the vocal cord and then leave the other side, depending on the pathology for another day. Can you describe um, what, what your operation is exactly for using, are you using like the CO2 laser um, to sort of demucosalize or, you know, that area, are you looking to create a specimen? Yeah, for the CIS, I would want to create a specimen. You know, maybe I would start with a few kind of targeted excisions to look at pathology for this Plasia, I would just look for a superficial type of ablation. I like the microscope with the micro manipulator if I have good exposure. If my exposure isn't good, I like the luminous handheld CO2 laser. Do you also I, use KTP at all? I haven't used KTP. Fabic, what would you do now? Um, it's very similar to what uh, Arno said. I think we, we need to see what we are dealing with. and. I think we do need to have some specimen. There's nothing wrong. I mean, some of our laryngology colleagues are very aggressive with KTP. The fact that you don't have any visible tumor on CT scan is a little bit reassuring, but I'm not convinced that this is all superficial and it's all mucosal disease. So I would like to know how deep the tumor goes. Um, personally, when they have cancer everywhere, I, you know, I'm, I'm a simple surgeon. I say you need to have a target for the surgery. I wouldn't be very heavy handed, especially with someone who has a very good functional. So I'm not trying to do a big uh, cordectomy and stuff. I'm, I would re-examine, but I'm kind of leaning a little bit more toward the radiation. Okay, so um, Dr. Buley is considering a sort of spot welding or spot excising some with a laser, the most uh, worrisome areas. Uh, Dr. Give you some ideas for radiation. Um, or trending toward any other uh, suggestions or thoughts you would do differently for this patient at this point before Pete discloses his next step? I guess I would want to know, like I would consider rebiopsying to yeah. look and see if we have invasive, because that also tells me if I need to address the next, you know, or not, because, you know, T1, even superglottic, you know, the rate of occult disease actually is, is quite high. So at a minimum, I'd want to just confirm um, you know, and, and I think if it was, and then assuming it is, and, you know, and I'm considering surgery, I, I, I tend, if it's a lot of like field cancerization on the larynx, particularly the glottic larynx, I, I'm not a big fan because you are going to have poor voice outcome. If it was isolated, just the epiglottis, that's a whole different kind of story, but mm -hmm. because it's diffuse, I also kind of would probably lean more towards radiation. Okay, great and ideas all around. came up from the fellows that uh, what would be your margin delineation or kind of when do you say it's a field cancerization? So, Arno or I mean, this is, I mean, the, the potential for invasion was just seen on the epiglottis in this one. And, and can we go back to the pathology, initial pathology? I think it was low grade on the opposite cord. So I think, I mean, low grade, you know, is not hugely concerning. So I think this doesn't probably... quite, this isn't quite field. I mean, this is kind of on the border, but I wouldn't quite call sure. this cancerization. I think there's an opportunity here, hopefully to treat this without radiation still. Okay. I, you guys also like the question, the what's his voice like now? You know, like if he's already gravelly and hoarse or is he, you know, a, a singer? Yeah, he's gravelly and hoarse. He's a smoker for 30 years with lung cancer. Yeah. So he, he, he doesn't we're, sound right. We're not, we're not making that better or worse. <laughs> no. <laughs> In the interest of time, Pete, why don't you proceed to your next slide after the other okay. one? All right. So I decided to take him to the operating room because I, I was concerned about the, car, the potential invasive component of this. And I wanted to get a, a clear diagnosis of invasive carcinoma or carcinoma in situ before I, I made any treatment decisions, definitive treatment decisions. Um, so I took him to the operating room and I did a micro, uh, micro suspension laryngoscopy and I used a KTP laser, but I used it as an ablative tool rather than uh, um, a, a, to get a specimen. If I set it at three watts, four watts continuous, I can make an incision with a handheld piece and I can use it a lot like, uh, like a knife. And I excised the, um, the epiglottic portion of it as much as I could on block. 
and I took it down to the um, perichondrium um, in the area that of concern where the initial biopsy was done. Um, I, it extended way too far to take it all out on black because it was extending in, into the um, area epiglottic folds and the false folds as well. Uh, but the, you can see all the margins that I, I took at this and there was high grade dis, uh, dysplasia um, and the right epiglottis, the superior epiglottis, the, um, um, the, um, and then the false fold. Um, um, but the laryngeal surface had at least, uh, it had invasive moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, at least five millimeters. And this, it was not invading through the epiglottis. My deep epiglottic margin was, was negative um, uh, for this. But now we have a, a diagnosis of invasive squamous cell carcinoma. And this yeah. with the margins that well, were- Well, I'm glad that you brought the nastiest case possible. <laughs> you do a nice- American cancer everywhere. Yeah. So, yeah. so Pete, do you consider this a negative margin excision? No, not at all. Okay. This is all right. a positive margin totally excision. clear. Yeah, I, okay. I do not think. I just tried to do as much as I could. I said, I'm going to go in there. Let me see if I could take all this out. Um, but I was, I, and the margins I sent interoperatively were, were high grade dysplasia, and I couldn't find an area where, what was, where it was clear. I take it off with cold steel at the, at the margins to send them for uh, um, frozen, and I knew I couldn't clear this surgically at, at and that You didn't time. take anything out of the glottis, correct? This is all super glottis. This is all super glottis. I wanted to get the diagnosis of invasive because the other one, he did a, uh, the laryngologist did a very good uh, job of the excising the um, right vocal cord and I, I didn't see anything on there anymore. So I was focused on the invasive, uh, confirming invasive carcinoma. Why don't you finish up your slides, Pete, and then we'll have some final comments. And so that's it. The, the question now is, uh, would you uh, try to do anything more surgically or go on to um, um, radiation for this, this patient? Yeah, so no, Nicole, what would be your, uh, we'll start with Susan after. Susan, what would be your preference now at this point with this pathology report? You can go back one, Peter, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, so based on this initial presentation, the patient's function um, and my predisposition, I agree. I think the, you know, the right step is to, is to pursue repeat biopsy to demonstrate invasive carcinoma. And given the, the overall dysplastic change, in the larynx, I would lean towards radiation. I, I tend to be very conservative with surgical management of laryngeal, early laryngeal carcinomas with a discrete lesion that I feel like I can take out with clear margins. And I feel like that's really not the case here. Great. Nicole, any, would, would you do the same thing? I agree, 100%. Okay. Anybody do anything differently at this point? Re recommend a patient for radiation? Yeah, I, I do recommend radiation. The one thing I would say is we routinely at NYU, we routinely, any uh, superglottic, we send them for HPV as well. This is not HPV, yes. this is probably smoking related, but that's how that has become our routine with the new papers that show up to 20, 25% of superglottic could be HPV positive. Might make a difference. Great, thanks everybody. Um, if you wanna unshare your slides, P, and we'll move over to Steve's and I'll make some final comments. I, I think, uh, thank you very much for a great first case. Um, I think it's important here to some take home messages that when you have ill-defined margins or edges of for, and the lesions are poorly defined, I think surgical resection, uh, or sorry, definitive surgical resection is very difficult. And so I think in those spaces, like everyone was saying, um, once you have a known diagnosis of cancer, I think moving to radiation as your definitive treatment makes a lot of sense. Um, I'll just put in a side comment that, um, you know, with the carcinoma in situ, the expectation is most of those cancers would progress to invasive carcinoma left alone or the natural history there. So I think also uh, recommending radiation prior to a definitive diagnosis of cancer is also a reasonable approach because carcinoma in situ, is, there's an indication for radiation for carcinoma in situ alone. But I think having a definitive diagnosis of cancer certainly is helpful in uh, pr having a good prognosis for the patient. So thank you sure, for a great case. If I could just add, I've definitely been in situations where I've done one, two, and three biopsies trying to document invasive carcinoma in a patient with really diffuse carcinoma in situ. And, and our radiation oncologists have been cooperative in saying, okay, you haven't found it, but obviously this is headed towards cancer. And so they radiated. So I've appreciated that. Yeah. And I've, I've actually had them radiate for even just high grade dysplasia, you know, like diffuse high grade and moderate dysplasia. And the literature actually is pretty good about, 
you know, con local control, you know, it's, it's almost identical to what you see with like T1 invasive with radiation alone for even high grade to moderate dysplasia. Great. Steve, why don't you start with your case? All right. So I have um, MR, he's a six year old gentleman who actually was diagnosed with a stage 1A squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. And actually he was referred to me because of an incidental finding on their pet that they were doing a workup for his lung cancer. But in, in talking to him, he had, you know, at least a year and a half history of, you know, sore throat, dysphonia. He actually had some homopsis and some dysphagia. He'd occasionally choke on some liquids when eating, you know, um, and, but he had no dyspnea and he actually, you know, worked for GM and he was actually pretty active. Um, and really kind of the plan was thoracic surgery was planning to do a low back to me, um, you know, later, later in the month. Um, and so they wanted us to like kind of weigh in on what to, what to make of this pet finding. Um, you know, he did have a history of a pulmonary embolus with infarcts a couple years prior. He was on blood thinners and he, he, he does have a family history of clotting. Um, he, he was a former smoker. He stopped at the time of his lung cancer diagnosis, but has a 90 pack year. Um, but he doesn't drink alcohol. And like I said, he was actually a pretty active worker in a warehouse uh, for General Motors. Um, on my, you know, physical examination, he was a well-appearing thin male. Really, most of his head and neck examination uh, was normal. You know, he did have a breathy um, kind of voice, but no obvious strider or stirter and um, just a little bit of hoarseness, as you'd expect with kind of a long-term smoker. And so I, I scoped him in clinic. And as you can see, here's the vocal cords. And there's a mass coming down from the top part of the epiglottis, extending inferiorly along the laryngeal surface down to uh, the petiole. I actually, I'll do this occasionally, and I'll, I, I did a, a flexible, flexible bronch and was able to actually get a diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma in clinic. Um, you know, when we did that based on frozen section, I, I was trying to move a little quicker with him because I knew that thoracic uh, wanted to kind of get get the ball rolling with his uh, lung cancer. So I, I did have a uh, invasive squamous cell carcinoma diagnosis just right out of clinic. Um, and so based on that, I was able to get uh, imaging. And so we did uh, next CT, um, which basically showed um, this, in, this enhancing mass on the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis. Um, as we kind of come down, you see the mass kind of tapering out. We did not see any pre-epiglottic apparent paraglottic invasion, and then there was no adenopathy and actually his vocal cords actually look clear as well as the piriform uh, sinuses. Obviously he came in with a pet. I don't normally get pets for early stage um, cancers, but you know, it basically confirmed the finding of you know, avidity on the laryngeal surface of a glottis, kind of extending down. This looked you know, a little bit more ominous that it was approaching the anterior commissure and then the vocal cords, um, as we saw in the CT scan, appeared clear. So our plan was to take them to the OR and, and evaluate, could this be removed um, surgically? I also had to coordinate with thoracic surgery um, and try and figure out what we wanted uh, to do. So let me uh, pause you right there, Steve. Can you go back to the initial index lesion? And I'm gonna ask Pete, um, I know it's hard to, on the images, but um, well, I'm going to ask Steve Rowe first. Did you, would you think that this was a single subsite and therefore definitely, T1, de or did you call it a single, T2? Definitely single. Well, uh, definitely, it looked like single subsite. I don't think it was quite down, you know, into okay. the glottic larynx yet. All right, so this is a T1 N0 superglottic larynx cancer. Uh, Pete, what are you thinking now for this case? You have the imaging. The function is excellent. There's no pre epiglottic space involvement. So here, uh, what do you think? I'd like to um, see if this is a minimal surgical resection. Uh, this looks like a pretty well-defined uh, tumor. Uh, and I can see if you can get clear margins around this. It looks like you could uh, potentially get clear margins on it. It really would depend on the uh, visualization in the operating room. Um, if you get a, uh, yeah, so what kind of scope can you get in there? Can you get a good view of it in order to get all the way around this? That, that's the limiting step in trying to take these out with transoral laser. So before stepping to more a technical issue, um, 
can you just tell us what um, what are some of the considerations you think about for the, you know, one of course it was just visualization, but other basic, basically patient parameters, access parameters, tumor parameters, broadly speaking, you know, ask some other people to chime in for any extras. No, so I wanna make sure the patient isn't aspirating. So I'll have my speech pathologist uh, evaluate the, the patient first and uh, make sure they're a good candidate for, um, for, for surgery. And it's good to know in, in, in general, all, all patients see speech with laryngeal cancers. Um, we already done the, the imaging for them. We already had the biopsy. Um, so, and uh, we know his, uh, his voice quality is really good for this too as well. So I think that's about it before I would go. Does anybody get any other testing? Do people get PFTs? Um, anything like that? I would take his clinical history into account. If he seemed to be a pulmonary cripple or challenged in that way, I probably would. But I'm leaning towards a surgical resection of this one and done, clean, get it out and move forward with treatment for his other malignancy. And in this case, he's going to get PFTs because he's uh, because of the mm -hmm. lung lesion. Oh, so sure. it, it'll be perfect to get them together, you know. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I think I want to emphasize that um, I think having your SLPs partnered up here is really important because there's a 100% chance there's going to be some degree of aspiration with any surgical procedure. Yeah. And so I think having them on board and having their input, especially pre-surgically, you want to cut it out and find out that, oh, yeah, their function was terrible pre-op and you just didn't really, you know, have a your colleagues, you know, fill in, fill you in. So I think that's really important. Um, uh, I would say this is a, this looks like a good lesion for a, uh, endoscopic laser. And for those of you who haven't seen uh, Petra Ambrose, um, does a really nice course, and she does this big supraglobic laryngectomy with excellent outcome and excellent technique. Um, and this seems to me that would be a good lesion because you can basically use the margin. Your deep margin is epiglottis, which is cartilage is a little more resistant, and you can just take it all out not get, getting to the superior uh, anterior commission or the glottis, so your issue not, shouldn't be too much of an aspiration. That would be my thought. And no, and so Mike, that's good. Um, sorry, Zender, Chad Zender here. I just, the other thing too is radiation also doesn't uh, avoid some degree of aspiration. I've, right or wrong, yeah, you know, very people true. on the radiation and they've done right. miserable and then you end up doing a total and you wonder if you would have just uh, resected the... Uh, uh, epiglottis and, and treated the necks. And I'll let you guys speak more to that. They would have done better, but radiation does stiffen fibros and uh, has its set of issues. So it alone isn't always a better option. And as somebody who went over to Kiel and spent some time with Petra, yeah. um, it's pretty amazing what they'll do and throw a dab off down and have a meeting within four or five days of their surgery. So um, it's amazing what these people can tolerate to your point, Babak. Yeah. Thanks, I, I Thanks Chad, easy. for being our super secret senior um, <laughs> on the call today. Yeah. Um, Mike, Mike Moore, um, could you comment on what you would do as from a surgical approach, like which laser you would choose and just any um, uh, briefly some technical considerations, like you split the tumor in half and cut it out piece, you know, in piecemeal in an organized way, you try to resect it and block. Yeah. So um, this in many ways, it seems like it'd be well suited to do the, um, one of the rare ones, actually, you could consider a nice on block or section. A lot of times it seems that way and then you try and do it and it ends up being so much more of a struggle. Uh, that said, if you just bisect it right down the middle, that should yeah. give you very nice control around the petiole, which is nice. And then you can just kind of take it up one half at a time. There's really, you, you feel like anytime you're violating a tumor that it's gonna make your margins tricky, but this one, your deep is gonna be nice and controlled because of the cartilage. The, the, the area you really want to make sure you've got a good sense of is a petiole. Um, you know, hopefully on one like this, because you're not really overly concerned about airway issues, just using a small laser safe tube for airway management rather than needing a tracheostomy. Um, and then, you know, that kind of allows you to then retract it over and, and optimize your lateral margin as well, making sure that's clear. So would there yeah. be anybody using a different technique, like a non CO2 laser approach or even a robot? Like the robot is really too bulky. If you could, with a single port, it, but it's very rare they're going to be able to get down there with the, the retractors. I, I think I would try if I could, if I thought it was amenable, but this looks a little too deep for, for, for a robot. Okay. So broadly speaking, I CO2 micromanipulator, people are going to do surgery. Okay. Um, Steve, next slide. 
That's about it, because, yeah, or actually, let's see here. Because, so I was going to say what I ultimately do. Well, and then the question was, we also had a question is, what do you do about the next? Yeah, do that's you, always a tough you, question. So Susan, yeah. what would you do? So you, if the surgical resection goes great, um, what is your plan? I mean, presuming your surgical was going to go great, it feels good. What, what are you going to plan for the next upfront? Susan? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm here. I, you know, oh, I think, thinking. You know, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, 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 what do you think about the, what would your plan for the next, um, for this case? Yeah, so if I'm managing the primary um, in a minimally invasive, like laser or robot way, then my plan for the next is typically radiation. I, I, I will reserve, you know, surgical neck dissection for something I'm doing surgically overall. Um, I mean, but if you were planning a primary laser resection, you would <coughs> do a neck dissection for both necks? You would. No, I, I feel like I, I feel like I would move towards a, a you know a, a transoral natural orifice resection for something where you know I was prepared either not to manage not to treat the necks or to treat the necks with um, lower dose radiation. Okay, uh, Arnold, what would you do? I would probably lean towards surgery. I think there's an opportunity to treat this guy with single modality <laughs> therapy. And that way we leave radiation for, you know, for recurrence if, if that, uh, you know, if he ever would recur that we would have a backup option. So, so I would probably do bilateral next section. You would do bilateral next? Okay. Um, Mike, what would you do? Would you, for the next? Yeah, I would do bilateral two through four um, selective, but I, you know, I may stage it, you know, do it at a later time once the kind of periopedema. And this one probably wouldn't be a real danger airway wise, but I would consider just staging it. Then you kind of get the, you should hopefully have most of the margin status ahead of time. But if there's any question, you could also clear up a margin at that time too, if there was any concern. Nicole, Pete, would you both do a neck dissection for this case if you're planning to manage the primary surgically? would. Um, my question would be for the thoracic surgeon, you know, if, if there's a concern about the phrenic, just maybe, you know, I would, I would stage the, the surgeries. Maybe I do the epiglottis, then they do the lung, and then I do the neck. I say, or I do the neck on the contralateral side from where they're doing the wedge, just, or, you know, but I kind of play, talk with them about you know, I mean, certainly we can do a great neck dissection and be very careful about the phrenic, but I would, I would consider that just because we know he needs thoracic surgery too. Okay. Pete, any other comments? No, I, I agree with uh, neck dissection for this. <laughs> Out of curiosity, if this was a left AE fold lesion and very T1 and zero well circumscribed, you're like, you know, ready, ready with your laser. Would you, would everyone on the call still do bilateral necks or would we consider ipsilateral neck? I would do ipsilateral. You would do it slider back? Yeah. Steve? Yeah, if it's not involving the epiglottis and it's truly lateralized, I'll do ipsilateral. Okay. Would anybody do bilateral? Okay, interesting. All right. Um, you want to finish up your slide, Steve? So we actually, uh, we're going to talk about the next a little bit more. Um, we actually have an interesting thing we do at Michigan. We actually stage, but we do the next up front. Because what's going to drive the need for radiation or even chemotherapy is going to be almost always nodal disease. I mean, you can talk about P&I to a certain degree, and if they have nodes and they're going to need radiation, we're not going to do dual modality to the larynx if we can avoid it. And so oftentimes we'll stage it and do a neck up front, and then if that's, you know, can get away with surgery alone, then we will then go on and complete the um, uh, primary resection. And it, actually, that's how we actually look at HPV positive tonsil cancers and basic tongues. We use stage and we do the next up front so we know what we're dealing with. Um, and that's just, that's our general approach uh, to a lot of these um, when you are trying to avoid multimodality uh, therapy, particularly to the uh, organ. Um, the other thing that we discussed a lot was we, I was like, oh, he's great. He can walk up a flight of stairs. He's doing fine. But the question then was, well, what are his PFTs gonna look like after he loses a low? Right. You know? And that actually was where we, we got into a big discussion in our tumor report. Cause we said, you don't know what's gonna happen, you know, in terms of that, um, that regard. 
Um, and so we went back and forth and, and the other issue was thoracic was gonna have to put, put in a pretty big luminal tube in and how are they gonna manage that? Um, we ultimately decided to, to proceed with the neck dissection with a plan for a staged, um, staged supraglottic laryngectomy. I, I always re I always assess to make sure I have good access. And actually I biopsied around the lesion just to make sure that things were clear. And he actually had positive submucosal disease going down into the anterior commissure. Oh, wow. um, and so I, I, at that point said, this is not something I think is worth going after. Would anyone go after that? No. No, no. I, th I think in general, submucosal disease is what every makes all surgeons cringe. This disease that you can't see that burns you on the margin. So if you can identify that early and know that that's going to limit your resection, I think it's good to back out and retain the function and go another modality. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Steve, just a quick yeah. question. When you guys, and, it, and certainly there's logic to it, um, when you do the next first, but if it is positive, let's say there's two microscopic nodes being a little unorthodox, do you then treat them with chemo radiation or just radiation alone saying the neck has been treated? Um, if you're going to go with then non-surgical therapy to the primary, but you've treated the neck surgically. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we are pretty like nodes or nodes microscopic. We don't, you know, we don't dis dissect that terribly, particularly for HIV negative disease. It's, a, it's another argument when we are talking about HIV positive pharynx disease. But if there are two nodes, we will go on and, and treat with definitive chemo and radiation therapy, treat them as a stage, the stage four. You're still using, in some ways, trimodality therapy. And if you'd have treated the primary with surgery and the next, and again, assuming he's N0 on the CT scan, uh, unlikely he's going to have ECS or you know six nodes positive or something crazy you might get away with surgery and radiation to a lower dose versus, you know, chemo radiation to the primary and then to the next two. So just a thought. I mean, yeah, yeah. No, but and we do that for oral cavity all the time. You know, we don't do chemo or T4 positive nodes. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, but I guess, you know, we're looking for organ preservation. You know, as there was oral cavity, we are ablating the primary organ and that's just part of the standard of care. Whereas there is, there is an equal modality for larynx that we don't have for oral cavity. Thanks everybody. In the interest of Steve, you have, you, you have no more slides, right? No, that's it. So, uh, let me so you, you want to unshare your slides? Well, and I'll so you did uh, RT alone or chemo RT? Oh, oh yeah, what we did, we did, we did RT alone, you know, RT. again, you know, cause we didn't do the neck cause I didn't do the yeah. next cause I, he had, I was not going to do his primary. Yeah, got it. Um, okay, so Everyone, somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides okay. Yes. Awesome, thanks guys. So this is our last case for early larynx cancer. So this is a six year old male who presents with hoarseness for the last six months and which has been progressive. No problems eating, drinking or swallowing and has no weight changes. He is a significant smoker with a 50 pack year smoker, two packs a day for 25 years, as well as a drinker with two to three beers in the evenings. He's a, a truck driver and is a sole breadwinner for his family. Um, his otherwise clinical examination is benign. He has uh, hoarseness, but no strider, no shortness of breath. There's no lymphadenopathy. I wrote that twice. That's how important it was. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and basically, uh, there's nothing significant in clinical examination. He had been seen by an out outside ENT and had had a CAT scan and an outside biopsy, which we'll discuss in a second. Um, but an office endoscopy is performed. So here are his images. Um, I'll let you guys kind of absorb that for a second. Um, and he has normal vocal cord mobility. Um, there is tumor on the bottom left-hand side that extends to the anterior commissure. And you guys can see my mouse. Give me a thumbs up if you can see my mouse. Yeah. Okay, uh, there's a little, it creeps up onto the false vocal cord. This is obviously, this is a, a operative evaluation, but just helps to sort of frame our case very nicely. So um, Dr. Givi, what do you think about this lesion? And what so, are you thinking next? Oh, sorry, um, um, one more thing. But before you go that, let me just do this. Um, the CT scan that was sent with the patient uh, did not show any obvious lesions or, and, and no obvious lymphadenopathy. Um, but the biopsy that was performed demonstrates um, high-grade carcinoma in situ. No invasive cancer is seen. And so he is currently staged a TIS vocal cord lesion. I'm just gonna go back so you can look at the images. Yeah. Um... 
So Kaplan, so his cord mobility is completely normal? Yes. All right, so I have a lot of respect for these kind of endophytic lesions that go in that they don't grow out. And as you can see, this is this probably a little bit bigger than what it meets the eye. Yeah. And these are the folks that I don't like to do laser because it, it, you're gonna cut a lot. And you're gonna lose that and it's, uh, up and down the cord goes up. I know that it's very attractive to try to do surgery and get it done with, but uh, this is a bad tumor. This is a bad cancer. And to be honest with you, these are the folks that I look for a reason not to do radiation, but to add chemo to it too. Nicole? I agree. Yeah, I mean, I agree that I think these are very bad actors. And I think, um, you know, sometimes our colleagues will, um, you know, sometimes the laryngologists start to go after one of these and now they end up coming to us having had a type four cordectomy and they have an absolutely horrible voice and, you know, we're stuck. Um, so I, I think these are much worse than they appear. Okay, so everyone is concerned about this. Um, Steve, what would you do next? The biopsy from the outside ENT came back as only TIS, as in situ carcinoma. Um, trust nobody and go back and do it again. <laughs> yes. Everyone I mean, agree with that? Biopsy for glottis doesn't mean, and the, the clinical image is much more important than biopsy. That you know somebody saw something going through the basal membrane or not. That doesn't mean anything to me. It's obviously, this is cancer. Okay. No, well, I think I, I, well, you know, um, I think Susan actually mentioned this. Is I actually saw cracked larynx at MD Anderson when I was a fellow. I'd never seen it before, and it actually can be quite. Correct. It looks. And so I, I want to get a. I want a, I want a true cancer diagnosis. I don't get tricked. That with I agree. Cracked larynx. <laughs> I'm the person who always says no cancer treatment without a cancer diagnosis. But if you have high grade dysplasia slash carcinoma in situ. Now, you might be right. If you're um, advocating chemo, it's better, much better to have invasive cancer. So that, that there's a point there. But once okay, you get so to everyone, carcinoma in situ with this. So everyone would take this patient back to the operating room for um, a repeat biopsies and, and, and evaluation. Yes. Okay. Um, I think that's a really good point. I think that, um, you know, unlike our previous case where there was a lot of carcinoma in situ, that Pete's first case, where you could say, well, the natural history is carcinoma in situ, so I think it's okay to go ahead and just pull the trigger on radiation or such. Um, I think it's really important to uh, define invasive carcinoma for this patient, which clinically I think everyone agrees is, is definitely present because um, it has important implications for um, prognosis um, and also having a realistic discussion with the patient. You don't wanna play it off like, oh, it's just some in situ, but we're gonna give radiation anyway. I think it's important to, be, to say, and I also think it's really important to um, size up these cancers ahead of time um, as uh, the images show here, and just from t some technical deal aspects, I use a, um, you know, if, if you have good access and I use the DITO, I use the laryngeal telescopes, and especially in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, both the 30-degree and the bottom right-hand corner, the 70-degree telescopes can really give you a good idea about um, the anterior commissure and some of the subglottic areas that sometimes are hard to see when you're just like using your eye uh, through the DITO laryngoscope. Um, so you do take the patient back for a biopsy. Um, and that biopsy comes back as um, uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So the question is, how do you want to manage this patient now um, with what you see? Susan? I mean, that seems right up into the anterior commissure. And I'm not an expert, you know, laser surgeon. I would probably lean towards um, radiation, but I, I would also turn to my laryngologist and my more experienced um, robotic and laser surgeons to see what they felt like they could do in terms of that involvement of the anterior commissure. Pete? I think anything up in the anterior commissure is, is difficult. Um, I'd, I'd be worried about it uh, creeping up into the um, up, uh, across the, into the anterior commissure, passed into the the um, preapoglottic space. I'm. I'm not. Uh, I would. I would lean more toward radiation for for this treat, this cancer. Okay, Nicole. I agree. I mean, I think you know the difficulty is that that the, you start cutting and it just keeps going, and as it goes further up into the anterior commissure and deeper, their voice outcomes only get worse and worse. I mean, it's different when you know, you're talking about maybe reconstructing that cord with 
either the false cord or maybe uh, moving some muscle over. But um, I, I just have not seen great voice outcomes with these. I favor radiation. Is there anybody here who would be interested in a surgical resection for this patient? Arnold, what about the West Coast? Do you guys go after these? So I would, I would just comment that, I, yeah, I agree. I wouldn't do a transoral laser resection. Um, I want to look back at that CT. I had to turn away, but these are tumors that, you know, if they creep into the anterior commissure, they can, they can turn into a T4 pretty quickly. So um, I do think that, you know, a super, if the per, patient was very surgically inclined, I think a, an open partial laryngectomy could certainly be a potential I'd want to get a little better look at the subglottis, but the supracricoid laryngectomy seems like this tumor would be amenable to that approach. And then obviously there's probably overkill, but a total laryngectomy would, would be the definitive. Uh, Anterolateral is another option for something yeah. anterior. If they were, yeah. you know, if I, I, I probably would favor radiation, but if they were, I've had a couple of patients that said no to radiation, so. When you do the supracricoid, Arnold, you come across the intercommissure formally and, and sort of leave a foreshortened cord? So you, yeah, you, you basically come like at the vocal process and, and take, leave basically just the written right process posteriorly. No, I mean, interiorly, would you take like a little, you cross over the intercommissure and come to the, to the contralateral side a little bit to take a, so you, you take a little bit of the contralateral cord. You do, in yeah. Apex as a form, as an yeah. M block, right? Right. Okay. Right. Well, so, um, can I add something before we move on. Sure. I, I would just really say it's important when you're talking to these patients to, um, to share what you feel in terms of level of risk in terms of, um, cancer versus not cancer and likelihood of cure with surgery versus non-surgical treatment. I think that patients really look to us for a lot of guidance in terms of what our expectations are. And, and so I, I think that our preoperative counseling is really important in these patients. Great. I think we've all been adequately warmed up with all of our cases. So this is all I have for this last case. Um, any other final comments for this case? Chad, I, I see you on the call. Any comments for this case? This patient, it did end up going for radiation and I think is about four years out uh, with no evidence of disease. Um, radiation alone? I think, radiation alone, radiation alone. I think radiation makes a lot of sense and it's not just the anterior commissure, that cord's really thickened. It yeah. looks like it expends back to the anterior or the vocal process. And I've had some colleagues attack this with the KTP and then I've, you know, there's a little bit of paraglottic extension and now it's upstaged to a T3 clinically and they're getting radiation or chemo radiation on top of it. Now, maybe they would have been understaged to begin with. Um, but I think, you know, when there's no radiographic evidence, um, this is somebody that would probably have a better functional outcome with radiation. I think that seems like the, I mean, that's the, what we would do. Yeah. The one thing I would say is this is the kind of guy that every time she comes back to the office for surveillance, I'd be very, very careful. And I have a, if I see anything wrong when I'm surveilling these guys, these are the guys that I take to the OR. Yes. And I have seen so many of these guys that come back two years, three years, four years later with a tiny spot and the cancer is at back. So these are bad tumors. You learn my lesson. No, I think, Bob, you raised a really good point that um, it's the endophytic tumor, the one that seems to, uh, like when you look at these, you know, a primary T1 glottic cancer, you have an excellent view in the office. Um, but if you see any vocal cord immobility or even like some paresis, that's sort of a change in clinical status. Um, that's a patient that should get immediately imaged and planned for the operating room. Because I think when these come back, they're actually can be very hard to actually diagnose. They can be, especially, um, you know, here on the top left, the tumor can be sort of tucked under the false vocal cord, uh, sort of into the ventricle. And unless the patient's asleep, you may or may not even see the lesion uh, for a recurrence. So um, I, I strongly agree with everyone, the, everything that's been said by the group. Any other final comments for this? I was just gonna show this slide real quick that um, there is a, uh, uh, while you guys think about any final comments, that there is a European Laryngeal, Laryngeal Society classification. Uh, Nicole sort of uh, commented for a type four chordectomy. It basically defines both a combination of depth and or 
depth combined with extra, which is what the um, little 5A, 5B, 5C, 5D are. And so just know that there are, are formal described laser, excuse me, um, usually with the laser, uh, operations for resection of both glottic and supraglottic early stage uh, laryngeal lesions that um, can help sort of structure how an operation would fit together for your particular cancer. Um, so any final comments? I, I know we started late, but I think we'll sort of finish closer to on time. Um, yeah, just one minor thing. Uh, when you're following them, um, just the symmetry of the edema is such a big thing. You may not see the tumor but uh, you know, if you see one side of the supraglottis is starting to get much more edematous than the other, <clears throat> it's usually a big red flag. Obviously, it could be radiation necrosis of the cartilage or something. But in reality, you know that and and being able to photo document the serial laryngeal exams are so helpful to really see how it uh, you have kind of comparing apples to apples for that individual patient. It's a great, That's a great point. point. Hey, this one is Don. Oh, hey, go ahead. Oh. Just one quick minor point, but um, when you go back to get that biopsy to prove invasive cancer, uh, and I think we all agree that radiation is probably best option for this patient, you have to have that plan firmly in mind because you want to do the smallest biopsy you can to prove invasion yes. and not be super aggressive with your biopsy and have the worst of both worlds, which is a bad outcome with radiation from a voice perspective, primarily because you went a little crazy with your biopsy. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing I want to add is um, when you look up a lot of these uh, radiation-based uh, CK series that show 80, 90% cure with um, radiation for T1 and 80, 70%. Remember, most of those, is somewhere in the method, they have shown that some of those people had a recurrence and they were salvaged by surgery. That's why they have control. So it's not all the end of the all. And number two is you will see some of these tumors that have radiated and they come back with very small local recurrences. And I would encourage everybody not give up on endoscopic to go back, even when it's radiated, if it's a good candidate. And also there are some cases that you could do an open partial, especially after glottic, if the other side is okay, even when they are radiated, uh, there are options less than laryngectomy, but you have to take to keep those patients very, uh, select those patients very carefully. Not everybody's a candidate, but it is possible. That's the one thing I wanted to mention. Great. Um, all right, well, thank you all. This was a fantastic session. I just want to put a plug before uh, Jeff, uh, the last word that, that in two weeks we're going to have a very special session that's the day after the election so if everybody is still in the mood we're going to have an all women session on thyroid cancer that we, we're very pleased with that and hopefully we'll have more attendance please join us uh, for a very special session of uh, women of head and neck or endocrine surgery and uh, all i can say is just vote all right Jeff. thanks Eric. Thanks, everybody. I want to thank my um, co-presenters uh, today, uh, Susan, Steve, and Pete. Thanks for being on the call. And of course, our other guest faculty, Nicole, our, um, and Chad, who is on the call, and Mike in Arno. So take care, everybody. Be safe out there. And don't forget to vote, like the Bobic said. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Take care.